So today joining us, we have Uduna Anazudu from the Consortium for Advancement of MRI Education and Research in Africa. And if I am correct, from Western University in Canada. Then we have Choyosun Lim from the National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore. And finally, we have Valery Kiselev from the University Medical Center in Freiburg. Um, let's see if the poll can be stopped now. What do you think, Francesco? Okay, so um, thanks. This is very insightful feedback for us. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm glad to see that all of you will participate again in another workshop. We'll take it for you know, future discussion. Thanks very much. So um, going into the panel discussion, as I mentioned, I would ask um, the, the three panelists we have joining us today to you know, do a, a quick round of maybe a couple of minutes to explain their background and their experience with open research and open science so far. And then we can move to in-depth questions about the, the topics that have been introduced already by some of the speakers. So um, I will start maybe with Uduna Anazudu. No, thank you very much, Amar. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, so thank you so much. I, I'm sorry I missed a little bit of some of the MR together sessions, but this one has been quite exceptional and I did enjoy all three talks and each of them sort of have an aspect of what drew me to, um, you know, more so not just open science, but being able to make healthcare or access to healthcare more accessible. Um, I think I come at it from both a scientific interest, but also a personal uh, uh, you know, reason for that. I, I was uh, born in Canada, but I grew up in Nigeria, and um, I've I've had a personal, uh, uh, you know, issues with access to healthcare. And uh, I'm not gonna, you know, kind sort of get into that. But there is a personal drive for being able to make sure that you know people uh, in low resource settings, just like uh, what uh, Sano talked about uh, when she talked about what's you know India and some of the issues they have in India. The issues they have in India is pales in comparison to the issues that we have in Africa. And, and you know, in India, there is obviously uh, some, I think, growing um, uh, uh, political will from the federal government to start to provide, um, um, you know, access to healthcare. We don't have that in Africa and Africa also. It, you know, it's a continent made up of different countries. So different countries have different approaches to healthcare. Um, I'm an MR physicist uh, by training. I do mostly brain imaging. But, um, you know, coming at this from a physics or engineering or uh, being able to, uh, you know, we talked about uh, making image um, softwares accessible. I do a lot of image analysis. Um, and so coming at it from that angle is where I'm trying to work on as well as what uh, Sonal talked, uh, talked about today, which was um, the human resource gap. It's all good to provide uh, MR scanners. And just like what she mentioned in India, there are those key uh, cities like Delhi and Mumbai where you have access to MR uh, scanners or we have uh, MR services that are on par to what we have in the West. Uh, in places across different countries in Africa, we don't have something that's similar in the sense that there are maybe pockets of, of centers that may have what comes close in terms of quality uh, to what you can expect at a um, middle level um, MR or imaging center here in the West. However, the biggest problem we have is a turnover rate. So if this, if this clinics, most of them are clinics, are able to attract the handful of foreign, not local, foreign uh, um, personnel, so foreign technologists, foreign physicists, uh, sorry, foreign uh, radiologists sometimes, they're not able to retain them. And so that's a, that's a, a, a different issue um, and, and how we train them. So, so there are not um, that many MR physics program, they're not that many new radiology uh, program for, uh, for radiologists because brain is a big 
uh, a clinical indication. We found that because we've done uh, some uh, surveys uh, in the region. And so even just being able to uh, to come, come up with ways to train is, is something that obviously um, that I'm also interested in doing. And I'll stop here for now because some of those uh, questions can be, can be raised and addressed. But just going back to your question, Emma, for me, I come at this from a personal um, um, both the personal and, and obviously scientific um, angle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe a few words from Choi Son Lim. Hi, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Yes. So myself, I am a clinical neuroradiologist and I work in a neuroscience center. It's primarily a tertiary hospital with primary hospital care. So we see all neuro all the time. And there are gaps in our scientific knowledge of the methods of science and the basic principles of MRI. So this has been a wonderful bird's eye view of the reproducibility problems, the data acquisition, the data standardization, and the important springboard to start thinking about translational research that arises from out of today's session specifically in the broader framework of the programming that has gone on for MRI together. So kudos to the organizing committee for putting together such a wonderful package. I'm still uh, at talk number 18 out of 33 that have been uploaded. So it is going to take some time to go through all the depth and the breadth of the inf information that's out there. So this has been one of the passions of mine, which is education, because education from the PhDs to the MDs has been one of the strengths of the diversity of the ISMRM. So that's the background. And uh, I'll hand off and hold my piece until we are in the full discussion of what um, we should reflect on today's talks and on some of the issues that have arisen, which are really, really very complex and very interesting. So back to you, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, and now we, uh, I'm asking a few words from the last um, panelist that we have, the third panelist for today, uh, Valery Kiselev. Could you please tell us a bit about yourself and your interest in open science? Thank you. Hello. So I'm uh, working on uh, microstructural MRI, which is uh, getting some information about the cell scale, the cell properties and so on, from images where you cannot resolve any cell, of course. Our images are limited to about a millimeter resolution. Cells are from 1,000 to 100 times smaller. So these activities uh, require a lot of physics. So my background is theoretical physics. And with time, I moved to MRI. And frankly speaking, uh, I often uh, face questions concerning the, the reproducibility, which are not on the level of devices, which are our scanners, but on the level of theory, actually, and understanding what we are measuring. I can give an example. If you go to any clinical scanner, you find and uh, try to do diffusion, uh, diffusion weighted imaging, you find the so-called B value on the um, interface. We know that uh, B value fully characterizes the measurement only in homogeneous fluid, like in just bottle of water, it will be sufficient. In real tissue, in the brain, for example, the Characterization of diffusion measurement includes time, diffusion is time dependent. That's why you need to go to give the gradient strength, their shape and timing. So the complete shape of the gradients and their magnitude. So if you don't do that, only B value is uh, achieved by different manufacturer with different means. You can increase the time of measurement of diffusion weighting, you can increase the magnitude. And of course, if you do a multi center study or try to compare things, you never get the same result if you do it in vivo. You can get even the same results on calibration phantoms, which is often done. 
But after that, you get results which do not agree with each other when you do real in vivo measurements. Mm -hmm. So that's only one example, but maybe the most uh, notorious. So, <laughs> so that's my position. We have to know what we are measuring. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think that this ties all the topics up because if we want to be more efficient in using our scan time, especially in areas where accessibility to MRI machines is, is you know, an issue, uh, then we need to be sure that we know what you're measuring, at least with exactly. a great confidence because time is, a, is always a resource, but especially in some contexts, um, there is not an opportunity for a second take, let's say. Exactly. So <laughs> when the experiment, the measurements should be very well prepared. Yes, absolutely. So um, moving, moving forward with this discussion, um, my question to you will then be, um, what do you think are the so I know that you might not had you might not have had the opportunity to follow every session, but we had some sessions on um, open data sharing and reproducibility issues and uh, standardizing image uh, acquisition and processing. Um, what what do you think is um, especially important at this? At this moment, uh, what do you think um, is especially important to focus on in terms of uh, reproducibility efforts and, and open science? I know that you all have your different specific interests, um, but how? what I'm trying to ask, I think, is how important it is that we keep discussing to these topics? Is there anything especially relevant and how important it is that we keep having this type of uh, workshops, like the one, one that is just, you know, um, that is happening at the moment? Uh, starting with the end, I would say yes. <laughs> the workshops are great. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, coming back to the whole questions it's a very good question because on the one hand it's good to have a reproducible for example publish the programs of course the data and programs uh, to allow other people to check validate and validate your results that's great that's open and that is of course you have to be uh, the author sh should be responsible for what they're doing on the other hand, uh, uh, we have two, there are two sides in MRI. First, we have, we are researcher. So by definition, we do what is not yet done. On the other hand, uh, we produce some recommendations and procedures for clinical radiology, where it should be standardized and uh, reproducible. So it's not that, I would say not all, should be reproducible at the first moment, so to say. So because there are some people running ahead, <laughs> ahead the lock, so to say, and uh, trying to do something which is not yet uh, established, those should be, of course, free. And uh, then the community should elaborate things uh, to offer the radiology. We wrote about that, that uh, preliminary or premature given some methods to to radiology is not good because the methods should be tested and validated within our community first, within the physics part of it. The examples are many because uh, there's a kind of typical paper, for example, can look like that. You have an acronym in the title, then a brief description, and then there, was, there will be a package released, which is very easy to use but nobody knows for sure what is inside. So that's not uh, what I would call a really reproducible science. And of course, while it is easy to use, it is used and there are many papers uh, already from the clinical side, we use such and such method acronym and correlate it with the disease strength or whatever. So that's not that, that should be really first uh, validated uh, between experts, I would say. So the reproducibility kind of um, has different stages, so to say. 
first experts, then a broader community. So yeah. that's roughly the answer. Thank you. Um, do the panelists have other thoughts on this or this summed it up pretty well? Um, I think there's a question um, from Francesco, but before yeah. um, you address that, maybe what I can say is that we've seen from the uh, European Imaging Biomarker Alliance and from the India experience that I think it's important for us to look at the clinical impact. It's not just the science. The science is very important. And everything that Professor Kisalev has said is driving in the correct direction of good science. The translational aspects of what I would consider rubber meets the road kind of research, we don't have that much expertise inside ISMRM as we have for the, di the data, the validation of some of the more hardcore items. So things like health services research, global health initiatives that have an impact on areas that are underserved and where there's inequality, there's too much variability of the health services. These are things that ISMRM may need to address or um, at least be aware of so that when we have the good signs, we can translate it in as fast a uh, situation as we can. Of course, you know, we don't have any control over the infrastructure and ecosystem. Uh, I think Dr. Sonal has very, uh, very clearly articulated that it's part of a bigger whole. And it has to do with what Francesca has said, that some of these developments are in one place it may be applicable to other places. So for something like, let's say, abbreviated protocols, because we are studying the science of different contrast mechanisms and how to refine those contrast mechanisms so that they have predictive value. But we can't use all of them in, this, in the time that we have in a patient encounter. So as a clinical radiologist, I want to know where I can get the maximum mileage because my funding ministry of finance is going to say, can we cut it down? And then of course, the commercial activities are gonna say, cut it down because scanner time is many, many dollars. So we want to, to do some of this thing. And the value initiative the ISMRM embarked on previously has been a good step in the right direction. Thanks very much, back to you, Emma. And I want to read uh, Francesco's uh, question and also point a good uh, portion of developed methods is developed in the West, Western world. And do you see the problem of the bias when applying uh, them to different countries that are often uh, overlooked? Uh, you. Well, yeah. I Oh, yes. so actually, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Dr. Krishna, you go ahead and I will, I will add to your. Yeah. I don't have experience of African, but yes, definitely. I have personally seen uh, that uh, what is happening like Siemens um, and GE, their data is driven by research in the US and UK. And the same machine is sold showing uh, uh, the data which is uh, which has been uh, published in the West, and now there is a thought that it may not work in India. We already know that the the cancer profile is different in India, and uh, we know uh, we have like the uh, a lot of things are different. Even like I work in HCC, I work in hepatocellular carcinoma, and even the response criteria which have been published um, don't work. So sometimes we have our own institutional response criteria. But the, but the problem in India is that there is good work happening, there is corruption and there is chaos. So uh, there is no government driven uh, drive to, um, to have standards which, have be, which are there, for example, by RCR or by um, by uh, American uh, societies. So the government, uh, uh, the stress on radiology is less, but there are now standards 
for example in maternity and child health so there now ultrasound is a part of maternity and child health so the the ultrasound research is very good because we have acts for example sex determination is illegal because people would determine and get it uh, aborted so uh, there is a drive but radiology uh, is clinically driven so government wants to bring down maternity and child health uh, uh, you know parameters so the ultrasound is very good um, likewise for stroke and non communicable diseases there is a discrete drive like for cancer or for uh, tb uh, uh, for um, a uh, stroke for heart diseases so it's it's very clinically driven so my request to all the researchers uh, is that the collaboration should happen to the clinically driven questions and there is very good work happening uh, dr thomas won uh, team and uh, uh, sairam they have collaborated with what is known as amri which is automated mri um, uh, acquisition and interpretation Uh, in neuro radiology and they are testing it out in northeast india where it's similar to plug and play where you just do one or two sequences and you answer basic questions i don't know what the results are but but there are things happening sorry sorry i interrupted you no that's great uh, and and like you said the the contrast between india and africa does exist and i mean I, i'm going to use africa because that's where i work and that's uh, what i i sort of know in terms of working in areas where a good portion of what we do in the west does not actually translate um i'm not a radiologist um but again like basically on the science side and coming up with methods uh, for example a lot of the methods i work on are stuff like a turbo spin labeling for blood flow imaging one of the reasons i started working on that because it's contrast free because contrast enhanced mr is not something that's really available a lot of the contrast agents are not even sold in in the region they're not available for for uh for clinics or radiologists to to purchase because a lot of these uh um uh, the regulations that we have here in 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 the west are not there and so they don't oftentimes sell some of this contrast especially mr contrast agents so some of these tools like atrospin labeling which has been around for almost 15 years i mean we don't have it here in the west in terms of uh using it clinically and getting it reversible but we've done a lot of research now to show that asl is ready for clinic and i think being able to translate a good portion of that research to areas where they do need it right now um is something that we also should talk about so that's on one side and then the other side is a bias um and what uh, dr krishna talked about in terms of um you know some of these tools like plug and play plug and play will not work very well for most uh centers in the continent because unlike india a lot of the scanners that we have are not identical to what we have in the west what i mean by that is um i was uh, in nigeria in january 2020 right before covid and i went to i think i'll say maybe about 15 different mr centers so from both uh, uh academic centers to clinics and i saw maybe about i would say 15 or so odd uh new when i mean new i mean like installed within 6 months of so within the end of 2019 early 2020 um from philips to ge to uh, uh siemens they all had different names so they're not they're not the same the platforms are different um and a lot of them are repurposed mr scanners that have been basically slapped with a new name so they just have a new badge on it so plug and play in terms of i'm going to sit in colombia i'm going to sit in stanford i'm going to produce uh, a a sequence then i'm going to run it um you know um autopilot from stanford that won't work it won't work there because the scanners are totally different and the issue is that the this scanners are sold as purely clinical system so they don't have research licenses um and that becomes a problem in terms of being able to translate some of the research protocols i talked about asl because asl is not a research a uh, tool there are asl sequences for example on some of these scanners but they are they are locked in the sense that you cannot tweak it to start to use it for some of the imaging uh applications that they need in africa for example has a unique patient population so uh it's a good question to ask francesco i don't know how we can address some of that but i think this particular meeting is a start on how we can start to address some of the gaps in this and the way we develop mr technology and how we translate it yeah and also reproducibility is another issue besides uh, translate to clinic 
And also another we have question um, about how we can encourage scientists and researchers to be part of open science and reproducible science in different countries. What do you think? Um, or, or maybe just to, you know, contextualize this question a little bit with what's been said so far. Um, do you think that if we adopted open science um, practices more broadly, also in Western countries, do you think that there will be an inherent benefit for early translation and early testing in some contexts that, as you, as you rightly said, are very different? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about catching the discrepancies earlier on before we have a fully tested tool that then goes to a, a reality where it's not useless, but less useful, I would say. Do you think that being in constant touch with reality through open development could help? Um, well, I'm just gonna start start off with that because A, I think I'm glad that uh, Sonal talk, touched on that as an ECR. So, um, you know, in terms of, you know, how can we encourage uh, our scientists or clinician colleagues uh, to embrace open science, I think that there are some barriers that still have to come down. And I think that the first speaker touched on some of those barriers, the way we incentivize or the way we, um, yeah, the way we incentivize uh, science or even, even clinical practice does not at this particular time fully encourage an open science ecosystem to, to sort of exist where we all can sort of participate and not have a, a uh, cost attached to that. Our, our scanners are not open in the sense that they're vendor, they're, they're, they're sort of locked in vendor. So they're not fully open for us to start to be able to work. Somebody mentioned being able to do uh, join multi-site studies. We can join multi-site studies if we have different scanners. So there's still some barriers that we have to overcome for us to fully, especially in the MR and imaging for us to fully embrace uh, open science as a community. Thank you. Okay, so I am checking just for you know the last time if there are specific questions or doubts from the audience. Um, and otherwise we are running a, a bit late. Um, and I know that some of the panelists have to leave soon. So if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you all very much again for participating in this discussion. Um, I think that you all provided very good examples of you know, situations in which open science really can help make a difference. Uh, and going forward, I, I ho hope that we'll all be more mindful about all these topics. Um, with this, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for joining the session. Thanks to the panelists and the speakers for participating. And uh, uh, we'll see you maybe in the next MRI Together event. I also want to remind you that all the content will be made available on the ESMRMB YouTube channel to watch uh, after the, the conference is over. And uh, thanks to my co-moderator, Sanama Sidi. And uh, see you soon. Take care. See you. Bye-bye.